Hello, my name is Phelan and I am the coordinator of the Barry Calhoun Kalamazoo Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area, or BCK SISMA. My goal is to combat the threat of invasive species in that tri-county area. Since there are so many invasive species, the backgrounds of my slides are invasive species I will not be able to fully cover. This first being emerald ash borer. You may not see the bug very often, but I'm sure you have seen the damage it has caused to our ash trees. This is autumn olive. An invasive species is a two-part definition. The organism has to be both non-native and cause harm to the environment, the economy, human health, or normally a combination of the three. For example, there are many varieties of apple trees that are not native but they do not cause harm and we like having them. On the other hand, poison ivy, as many of you know, grows aggressively and can cause harm, but it is a native species, so it would not be considered an invasive. So, oriental bittersweet is not native and can take out our native species. It checks both boxes and is considered an invasive. This is spotted lanternfly. For the purpose of definitions, a weed is simply a plant somewhere you do not want it, making any plant eligible to be considered a weed. This is common buckthorn. Most often the reason for the spread of invasive species is us, humans. It can be either accidentally or sometimes purposely moving the plant and not knowing it was an invasive and very rarely moving it and knowing. This is glossy buckthorn. The most common areas to find invasive species are in gardens or lawns because they were planted as ornamentals, in trails and road right-of-ways, construction sites, and ditches because they were moved by gear and equipment. This is purple loosestrife. Invasive species have common characteristics that allow them to outcompete our native species. They grow quickly normally starting growth earlier in the spring and continue growing later into the fall than our native species. They're able to tolerate a wide variety of conditions such as soil, moisture level, and sun. They have no natural predator or competitor like they would in their native environment. And they reproduce prolifically by either having a great amount of seeds or being able to spread effectively and frequently. This is the Asian longhorn beetle. Here is a list of invasives that are super common to this tri-county area. And here is a list of invasives to keep an eye out for. A few have been found in Michigan at low numbers and others have not yet been reported in Michigan. This is a tree infected with hemlock woolly adelgid. The adelgid itself is tiny, but it leaves a white cotton looking mass that you see in this picture. The Nature Conservancy estimated more than 1.4 trillion in damage from invasive species worldwide. This statistic is a few years old now, so I'm sure that that number would be even higher today. Now I will go more in depth with a few species, starting with giant hogweed. Native to Asia, it was brought over in the 1900s as an ornamental for an arboretum. There, we thought it would stay contained, but somehow it did escape into the wild. Now, giant hogweed is called giant for a reason. It can reach heights of 15 feet tall, and you can see some grown men standing next to the plant there. Its leaves alternate on the stem and they are both compound and lobed. The flower head of giant hogweed is considered a compound umbel, meaning these little groups of flowers all come together to form this big massive group of flowers and together they kind of have this umbrella shape. The stem has coarse hairs and purple blotches. And as you can see in this picture, the hairs become a little bit more dense around the node 
and the purple blotches are more dense towards the base of the stem. The oils from giant hogweed can cause photodermatitis, making the skin extremely sensitive to ultraviolet light and causing burns, which can form up to 48 hours after contact. And if the oils are in contact with your eyes, it can cause temporary or permanent blindness. There are a few species that are commonly confused with giant hogweed, the first being cow's parsnip. However, cow's parsnip only reaches heights of seven feet tall, so tall, but you can see with the picture of the woman, not as tall as the picture with the two men earlier in the slideshow. The flowers are flat topped compared to the more umbrella shape in the hogweed. The hairs on the stems are much softer and there are no purple blotches on the stems. Another look-alike is Angelica. This one reaches heights of nine feet tall. The stems are entirely purple instead of being blotchy. The flower heads are spherical, so they form these little separate balls instead of all converging together at the top. And the leaves are more like a normal compound leaf, so they do not have the lobes. The final look-alike for giant hogweed is poison hemlock. This one also reaches heights of nine feet tall. The stems have the purple blotches, but they do not have any hairs. The flowers are the umbels, but they are much, much smaller. And the leaves look more like that of a fern leaf. There is not yet a set management strategy for giant hogweed, but we do know that mowing stimulates budding from the rootstock. Some have had good results by digging out the entire root mass, but you need to be careful to dig out the whole thing as to not stimulate growth just like mowing would. Others have had good success with a foliar chemical spray. Removing the flower and seed head would just limit dispersal and you would get the same plants the next year. Next is Chinese yam. Native to China, this vine was brought over in the 1800s as an ornamental. Its leaves are fiddle shaped and grow directly across from each other on the stem. Chinese yam has strong parallel veins. So instead of coming from a central point and branching off, they all come from that middle point and go straight down. It is difficult to find a good picture of the flowers. At the sites I have been to, I've never observed the flowers growing, but Chinese yam does produce small bell-shaped flowers that are arranged in spikes at the end of its branches. Its tuberous roots are very large and can be eaten. In fact, if you Google Chinese yam, pictures like this bottom one and other cooking pictures are way more prevalent than ones of the leaves and other identification skills for invasives. Chinese yam produces these aerial baubles or tubers or also known as air potatoes. These are not seeds, but when dropped, they become the roots of a new plant. This is a picture from a local site of Chinese yam. You can see it both in the front foreground or twining around some branches, but then you can also, if you look really closely, see it in the background climbing up some other trees. This is that same site climbing up a tree, and then what is leaning against that house is a ladder, which so very easily take over any kind of vegetation around it. The list of look-alike species for Chinese yam is long, first being wild yam. It still has the parallel veins, but the leaves are strongly heart-shaped, and they have short hairs on their lower surface. Wild yam also does not grow the air potatoes. Next is green burrs. This is a family of vines with parallel veins, but the leaves are oval to shallow heart-shaped and the flowers are umbels. Again, this family of species does not produce air potatoes. 
wild potato, or native morning glories, have heart to arrow shaped leaves, and the veins are from a central mid vein instead of having the parallel veins. The flowers are large and showy, and again, no air potatoes. Next is the bindweed family. These have a similar shaped leaf, but the veins are from a central mid vein. The flowers are large and showy, and again, no air potatoes. The last lookalike for Chinese yam is false buckwheat. The leaves are more arrow shaped and the veins are from a central mid vein. The fruits are very small, but as you might have guessed by now, no air potatoes. Cutting and mowing Chinese yam will control spread because you are not allowing the air potatoes or the seeds to grow but the plant will continue to grow back until those massive roots are exhausted. Other management involves chemical foliar spray. This is swallowwort. There are two kinds of swallowwort, black and pale. The black has dark purple flowers and is native to the Mediterranean. The pale has light pink flowers and is native to the Ukraine. They are both brought over as an ornamental in the 1800s. Swallower is a vine with leaves that grow opposite each other. The leaves come to a pointed tip and have a smooth waxy coating. Both black and pale have star-shaped flowers. If you look closely, black swallower has a shorter, thicker flower than the pale does. Swallowworts have seed pods that release wind-dispersed seeds, much like that of milkweed seed pods. Swallowworts are toxic to the monarch butterfly. It is not clear how often they lay their eggs on swallowwort, but when they do, the caterpillars will die after feeding. The roots of swallowwort contain a chemical that is toxic to livestock when ingested. And, like other Invasive vines, swallowwort will choke out all nearby vegetation. Here's two examples of swallowwort doing just that in a forest. Here is a close up on how many seed pods can form on swallowwort. Milkweed is mentioned as a lookalike to swallowwort because of the seed pod and monarch connection. However, other than that, there is not much confusion between the two. Milkweed's flowers are clustered together, its leaves do not have as waxy of a coating, and even the seed pods are different, with milkweeds having a much larger seed pod shape. Another potential lookalike is the dog veins. The seed pods are similar, being long and skinny, but dogbane is not a vine and the flowers are bell-shaped. Digging out swallower is only effective if the entire root crown is removed. Otherwise, it will stimulate regrowth, which is what happens with cutting and mowing techniques. Seed pod removal will reduce spread, but it is nothing to the existing populations, so next year they will grow back exactly the same. Other management techniques involve a chemical foliar spray. This is invasive Phragmites, also called common reed. It is native to Europe. The first infestation in the United States was on the East Coast in the late 1700s. It is a restricted species in Michigan. This means it is illegal to buy, sell, or move Phragmites. Phragmites has a dense, fluffy seed head that is purple in the spring. In the fall, the seed head then turns straw colored, followed by the leaves and the stems of the plant. They then remain standing like that over winter. I have not seen a site quite as tall in this area, but in areas like the Saginaw Bay, the stalks reach heights of over 15 feet tall. When you pull back Phragmites leaves, you will see small hairs on the ligule. This is important to remember later during the lookalike species. 
Phragmites spreads via horizontal rhizomes. So, as you see in the picture, each one standing next to each other is connected to the neighbor underground. They also spread by seed. At first we thought the seeds were not viable, but we now know the seeds are about 30% viable. And with over 2,000 seeds on each seed head, that 30% really starts to add up. There was a study with Grand Valley showing that Phragmites decreases property values. It blocks views, water recreation, and sites at road intersections. Phragmites crowds out native plants and all the dead material left standing in the winter can cause a high heat and intense burn. Here you see Phragmites between a cornfield and the road right of way. This is supposed to be a boardwalk to a waterfront view. It can be hard to see, but there is a person standing on this boardwalk. This is the same boardwalk that the person was standing on before and after two years of management. There is a native species of Phragmites that does not grow as aggressively. They have reddish stems at the base, which is not present in invasive Phragmites. This is a native stand. You can see that the stalks are not as close together, the seed heads are not as dense, and the stand itself is not as high as the pictures of invasive Phragmites. I always like to think that natives just don't look as healthy as invasive Phragmites stands. However, there is a growing concern that natives are going to hybrid with invasives if they aren't currently already. Another lookalike is reed canary grass, which is also an invasive. Reed canary grass does not grow anywhere near as tall, but in the spring the two grasses look similar. To tell them apart, you pull back the leaf and you will see the, a plastic looking sheath on the ligule instead of the little hairs that we discussed earlier. Especially in the Great Lakes area, there is a lot of research going on about the management of Phragmites. Cutting, mowing, and burning only show top die-off and the same regrowth the following year. It is a grass, so it actually kind of likes those efforts. However, those efforts are beneficial after a chemical spray to remove the dead biomass. Digging is also very complicated because the roots go down just as far as the plant grows high. So that's really far to dig down. Phragmites tends to respond to chemical treatment, but there is a number of ways to go about it. And the best time of year for Phragmites treatment is closer to the fall. This is because with such a massive root system, you want the chemical to go down to the roots. If you spray in the spring, you normally just see top die off. The final one I will go in depth on is Japanese knotweed. It is from Japan. It was brought over as an ornamental in the 1800s. Even today, people still seem to like it in their yards because it can make a great natural fence with how tall and thick it grows. It is prohibited in Michigan, so it is illegal to buy, sell, or move Japanese knot. The leaves alternate on the stems, which form a zigzag pattern. The stems are hollow with a thick node, giving it a bamboo-like appearance. In fact, Japanese knotweed is commonly called Michigan bamboo, or sometimes just weird bamboo. Its leaves are flat at the base and pointed at the tips. Tiny white flowers form in a spike. Japanese knotweed is the first to come up after a volcano. So, it has no problem growing through concrete and road right-of-ways. or even housing foundations. This one 
and this one are both sites in Michigan where knotweed was growing through somebody's house. This is an abandoned building that knotweed is taking over. I didn't take this picture, so who knows what was there, but I'm sure it was just a small piece that decided to grow. Maybe from somebody parking their car there that not we was on. More just coming up through the foundation. In the UK, they have such a huge problem with it in housing that you can't sell your house with knotweed on the property. This picture sometimes can be slightly difficult to see, but when you mow knotweed, it only takes a piece the size of your fingernail for it to regrow. So in this picture, you see a large stand back by the building and somebody must have mowed that and then the entire lawn. So now you see little bits of knotweed respringing from everywhere in the grass. And soon this whole lot will just be a massive Japanese knotweed stand. This is it growing along the road right of way. Big problem with just a mower coming down and mowing everything and it just spreads down the street. Same concept with a river, little pieces will break off and float down the river and just keep spreading down, down, down. I find this picture to be really interesting because it is Phragmites and not weed growing right next to each other. I think it would be cool to see which one would outcompete each other or would they just stay stagnant because they're both so aggressive. There are other species of knotweed. I will go over the differences, but all are invasive, so there's no true need to tell the difference, and many managers just consider them all Japanese knotweed. But the first one is giant knotweed. Because the leaves are much larger, they are heart-shaped instead of flat at the base. They also have hairs on the underside of the leaf, which are not present in Japanese knotweed. The next is Bohemian knotweed. This one is actually a hybrid of giant and Japanese knotweed. The leaf bases vary on a single plant from the flat to heart-shaped that is presented in the flat being in Japanese, heart being in giant. You can see this really well on the picture on the right. It also has the hairs that are present in giant, but they are much shorter. The last and most different knotweed is Himalayan knotweed. This one is not currently found in Michigan, um, so it would be a big deal have, if you came across this one. Its leaves are lance shaped and its flowers are pink instead of white. It also has hairs on the underside of the leaf, but they are stiff in comparison to the giant and bohemian hairs. This is a side-by-side -side shot of all knotweeds going from giant to bohemian to Japanese to Himalayan. This key also points out the reproduction capabilities. Both Bohemian and Japanese rarely produce their seeds, while Giant normally does produce seeds. So that does give Giant a kind of a reproductive edge in spreading and reproducing. The most common look-alike species for any of the knotweeds is the native species pokeweed, also known as inkweed. The stems of this one are completely purple and they lack the nodes of knotweeds. The leaves are lance shaped, kind of like the Himalayan knotweed, but pokeweed has these 
strings of berries that you would not find in any of the knotweeds. One of the hardest things about knotweed is that everyone's first instinct and go-to management techniques always make Japanese knotweed spread farther. So how do you treat Japanese knotweed? Or any of the knotweeds? Do you cut it? No. That will lead to spread. Do you mow it? No. That also leads to spread. Do you burn it? No. That really won't do anything. It will grow back exactly the same. Do you dig it up? No, it has such a massive root system that it would be so complicated to get every single little piece that you would normally end up leading to spread. How about using glyphosate spray? Nope, not that either. In most cases, glyphosate only causes top die off and the plant grows more aggressively. Sometimes just to the side of where it was sprayed and sometimes exactly where it was sprayed. Do you ignore it? No. It will continue to build strength and continue to spread underground even if you don't see it spreading above ground. Just making management later more difficult. Should you follow best management practices? Of course. There are chemical treatments that have been shown to be effective for Japanese knotweed, but what you go with chemically depends on the site. Is it aquatic? Is it terrestrial? Um, time of year is a big dependent for which chemical you use. And no matter what chemical you use, the quickest Japanese knotweed has been seen as eliminated was after three years of treatment. And again, that was the quickest Japanese knotweed has been effectively managed. Now we're back to quick snapshots. This is spotted knapweed. Every county in the state is covered by a SISMA. How each operates is slightly different, but all have a goal on preventing invasive species spread. So if you are listening to this and you are outside the Barry, Calhoun, Kalamazoo area, there is somebody for you and you can still contact me and I will get you in contact with the right person. This is known as the invasion curve. It shows the easiest and cheapest way to manage invasive species is to never have them in the first place. So the invasion curve starts with prevention at the bottom left hand corner and then moves up to monitoring, looking for new species. If you find one, eradicate it right away. Next to rapid response, if it continue, you find more of it, contain it to certain areas and then you're on to manage and control where it is kind of everywhere, but you're making sure it's not spreading to new areas or high quality areas. This is multiflora rose. Prevention techniques include buying firewood where you plan to burn it so live insects are not transported via cut wood. When planting, choose native species. There have been many cases where a non-native species was recommended and then later found out to be harmful. A big example of this is autumn olive. Decontaminate gear and equipment between sites or trails. Don't release unwanted pets or plants into the wild. And educate on invasives so people know what they have before they manage incorrectly. This is European frog bit. It is an example of why you should not release unwanted plants or animals because it is a big one in aquarium trait. 
for new invasive species to the area, the first thing would be to report the infestation to someone like a CISMA representative. In the case of BCK CISMA, we would go out and verify the site and invasive for you for free. We would then discuss best management practices and talk about treatment options. We do have a cost share program for our priority species, which would be new ones or ones, think about the ones we talked longer about today. This is Japanese barberry. It is still very common in landscaping, but it does increase your tick population. For the invasive species that are kind of everywhere now in Michigan, the best thing would to still be determined best management practices. The CISMA, even for those super common invasives, will still do a site visit for free and discuss those recommendations for you. Also, if it's at a park or you have a group together and you want to do a volunteer work day, the CISMA will be happy to assist with that, to be there on hand to just guide the volunteers. This is Yellow Floating Heart. Here is my contact information. I am also available now for questions.